Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, expository study. We left off on verse 3, forbidding to marry. Now, is this about forbidding to marry specific people? Hmm. Let's go ahead and re read it real quick. Uh, we'll read all the way back up to catch up. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. That's the whole point we're talking about, that they're departing from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We talked about that. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. We talked about that. Verse 3 is where we're at right now. Forbidding to marry. That's one of the ways people are departing from the faith. They're falling into the trap of forbidding to marry. And commanding to abstain from meats. Which, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Remember what the Bible says, we're to pray without ceasing. You're to give God thanks in all things. Um, you give Him glory in all things. But we're going back to verse 3 where it says, Forbidding to marry. This took a while because the Lord was trying to open up and show me some things. <clears throat> Pardon me. So turn... Uh, well, if no turn anywhere yet, we, we're already here. But I wanted to show you a clip real quick by 33rd Book. He did a great clip, and the video is called um, The Only IQ Test That Matters. But I want to show this quick clip because some people think that forbidding to marry, it means for forbidding to marry certain people. And the... I'm speaking now about the only IQ test that really matters. Mankind has tried to give you test after test during your lifetime to see if you are intelligent. This is apparently uh, very important to a lot of people. Now the Bible told the Jews that they would seek after a sign. And I'm assuming that the average listener to this video will be predominantly a Gentile audience. Your problem is you seek after wisdom and you will go out of your way to be perceived as intelligent. And you don't like it when people think of you in the other direction. Now this picture right here is about 100 years old. It's a picture taken in America. Not some other country, but in the USA. The crazy thing about this picture is those men standing there cannot read. And they must not have much dignity left as if they knew what the signs they are holding said about them they'd probably punch out the guy that asked them to hold the signs. And you're probably asking, if they can't read, then who made their signs for them? The group's name was the Eugenic Society of America. Notice that this was not Nazi Germany, but good old U.S. of A. It was this group that made those signs for the men to hold. In case your video screen is blurry and can't make out the words that sign on the right said, I cannot read this sign. By what right have I children? The Eugenic Society of America was a group of individuals that worried about things. They worried about population control, and specifically, they wanted to eliminate people that they deemed unfit for living. They wanted to eliminate and kill anyone that wasn't smart. And they claimed that they were the smart people and they were the best judges of who should be allowed to reproduce. This is leftover evolutionary thinking. You have to be dumbed down with evolution teaching to get to this level of absurdity. And once again, this isn't Nazi Germany I'm talking about. This is America. You're looking at the Fitter Family Examination Building in Topeka, Kansas, 1920. And 1920 came along way before World War II Nazi Germany. This is 1920 eugenics teaching in Georgia, not Berlin, our own American heartland. In 1920, you would go to this building and subject yourself to all kinds of tests. 
These tests would determine if you were a proper person. And if you passed their criteria, congratulations. You would be allowed to get married and have children. Now, I don't want to offend anyone viewing this from California, but you have to cut us Midwesterners a little slack. For years, I grew up hearing people tell jokes about California and how wild and reckless certain places are in California. For years, people in the heartland of America would roll their eyes at hearing about how crazy they behave in Hollywood or San Francisco, but this is Kansas, not Berkeley. Now, here are the four generations contest winners. This is where this family was deemed healthy and pure and wise by the Eugenic Society in 1923. They won the first place ribbon. Here's the first place winners for best couple at the state fair in Texas, 1925. The Eugenic Society started influencing lawmakers and new laws were being passed. If the Eugenic Society deemed you unacceptable, then you would be classified as unfit. And even worse, they could classify you as feeble-minded. And if you were classified as feeble-minded, then you were forcibly sterilized. All because some nuts thought they could determine who should reproduce and who shouldn't. This part of American history doesn't get talked about, but it was very racist, and we were just as guilty of going along with these evolutionary teachings as Nazi Germany. You can imagine how certain groups of people would like to sterilize their opponents. But that only happens in Germany, right? And it was the last century. Surely we're evolving past that by now, right? But it happened over here. Here's a propaganda card trying to use cartoon drawings to scare you into submitting yourself for examination. Here a man wants to marry a beautiful woman, but she insists on seeing his eugenics certificate before she'll marry him. You had to have one of these, or your chances of getting the girl were very low. And what if the eugenic society didn't like your views on religion or social issues? They'd give you low marks, after all. To be labeled as intelligent, you have to think like the people evaluating you. So what he's showing there, if you follow along in that clip, what he's showing there, and I'll link the full video, it's one of my favorite videos that he does. Um, you have an occult group that says, hey, you have to marry with, we tell you who you can marry and who you can't marry. In other words, they keep them, it's, it's a form of control. Okay? But is this what this is talking about here? Remember, they're departing from the faith. What he said there, it was. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6.14, if you want to turn there. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Okay? You'll have cults out there that they don't want you to know the truth. So their form of control is they get to control you even in, when it comes to who you can marry. So it's kind of, like I said, it's, it has to do with they're keeping you away from the faith. But this is talking about in the latter times Shem saw to part from the faith. In other words, they're professing, we've talked about this, brother Jesus Christ, you have false converts, reprobates in the faith, and you have people that are truly saved or getting spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They're going after the world, I'll point out there, the world, and they're not going after Christ. Okay? So those are the two types of people we're talking about. I just want to show the clip because uh, the Eugenic Society of America, where they're trying to deem who's worthy to get married to and who's not. Is this technically what this is talking about? Like I said, I had some time with it and the Lord kind of opened my eyes. As a Christian, I will tell brothers or sisters in Christ sometimes, hey, you shouldn't marry that person. There's too many red flags. I don't think they're saved. So there's nothing wrong with a brother or sister in Christ warning another brother and sister in Christ saying, hey, I don't think that person's saved and you shouldn't marry someone who's not saved. Is that forbidding to marry? Yes. But is that what this is talking about? I don't believe that's what this is talking about. Okay? We can do that. There's times, brothers and sisters in Christ, that I've told people that are newly saved that they need to wait on the Lord. When you newly get saved, you've got a lot of problems in your life. 
Your life, because people believe that we teach that you have to clean up your life and then get saved. No. When you first get saved, your life is a mess. God's got a lot of work to do. And why I say that, I'm not putting you down, brother, sister Christ. I'm going off of my testimony and my experience. When God saved me, he had a lot of work to do to clean up my life. I wasn't ready for marriage. And nobody, I don't believe anybody's ready for marriage the moment they get saved. It's going to take some time. God's going to do some cleaning up on your life. You've got to get the feminism out of the, the heads and the hearts of a lot of the women out there that get saved. Uh, the men, you know, to taking on the roles of the women, I mean, they're not being raised as men, okay? But the Bible tells them, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to have the mindset, how you're supposed to look at things, how you're supposed to speak, your actions, your responsibilities in life. And God will clean it up and get all the wickedness and the sin and the junk out of your life. Help you to overcome sin. I can do all things through Christ. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I warn people that are newly saved, hey, you need to focus on your walk with the Lord. And as time goes on and you realize that God's really cleaned up your life a lot, and when they always talk about going through experiences, uh, you have a lot of testimonies on how God cleaned up your life, saved you, and then cleaned up your life and you have gone through experiences as you're cleaning up your life. Um, men, you go through experiences of having to discern and protect yourself spiritually, and you can be able to now, if you ever get married, now, after going through that stuff, you can protect your wife physically and spiritually. Okay, that person's false. We're staying away from him. That's a servant of Satan. We're staying away from him. Those people aren't truly saved. We're going to stay away from them. You can protect your wife. It's called experiences. So I just want to say, there's times as brethren we can warn one another and tell people, hey, you're not ready for marriage or you shouldn't be marrying that person. That's not what this is talking about. okay? But you do have cult groups that try to come out and say, hey, uh, you can only marry who we say you can marry. That's an occult. And that is all about what we're going to be talking about, pushing people away from the faith. The, the, or, I'm sorry, I have to watch my words what he's talking about there is people preventing you from coming to the faith through forbidding to marry certain people okay but what this is talking about is you're getting people to turn from the faith okay depart let's use the right words depart from the faith you have people that verbally are standing for the faith and you have people who verbally and physically stand for the faith and both were seen depart from the faith. So what this, what is this really talking about? Well, I started talking with the Lord, and the Lord's like, well, think about it. What's the number one thing that forbidding to marry leads to, promotes big time? Okay, and we're going to talk about it. Ultimately, sexual perversion. We're going to start with fornication. We're going to talk about sodomy. And we're going to talk about going, other ways that they're going against the natural use of the woman. What does forbidding the Mary do? It opens up the flesh to be uh, carnal. And you sin. We're, I'm going ahead, getting ahead of myself. So let's get to some verses. You sin against your own body when you fornicate. Sex outside of marriage. Okay. Fornication is used as a term for um, uh, false gods. If you're married, you're truly saved, spiritually speaking, you're married to Christ. You're the bride of Christ. We will be married to Christ. Okay? But if you're going with somebody else, that's fornication. Mm -hmm. Forbidding people to marry, you know, be married to Jesus Christ, there's people that will forbid you to get saved. If you get saved, you're, we're going to cut you out of the family, you're not one of us, and they just kick you out. There's that part there, too. But let's talk about fornication. Acts 21:25. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they keep themselves from offer things offered to idols. Remember, the whole thing that I believe that forbidding to marry leads to fornication. And fornication, you sin against your own body. Look how they're telling them things offered unto idols. Why? Because then you sin against your own body. And from blood, you sin against your own body. And from strangled and from fornication. 
It's a big push because with the Gentiles, evidently it's a big thing to fornicate. You don't need to get married. Just fornicate. Do we see that today? Yeah. Turn to Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, though, for I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself highly, than he ought to think. Remember that as we're reading through these scriptures. What leads to fornication? What leads to sin for a season? Falling away from the faith. You think highly of yourself. Ye can be as gods. Knowing good and evil, but ye can be as gods. Then you start being, yea, if God said. We already talked about the doctrines. You start doubting and changing the doctrines. Why? So you can have sin for a season. You start getting puffed up. And you see that in a lot of these fakes and frauds, how puffed up they are. More highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay? Your bodies is a living sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 6.18. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee fornication. Flee it. It's not just, oh, stop doing that. Flee it. Run from it. Get away from it. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What does forbidding marriage do? I believe it leads to the push to fornicate. It pushes sodomy. Okay. And I know it's going to be tough for some people, but it pushes into child molestation. All, uh, bestiality, it pushes into sexual perversion, sinning against the flesh, okay. sinning against your own body. And remember, we're part of the body of Christ. So when you're doing this as a saved sinner, you're hurting the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 7 2. What's the solution when you have a problem with fornication? What's the solution? 1 Corinthians 7, 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. That's the solution to fornication, to get people away from fornicating. So when you forbid people to marry, what are you doing? You're taking away the solution. Mm -hmm. Turn to 1 Corinthians 5, 1. What does forbidding married lead to? We already said I jumped, I jumped ahead a little bit, but what does it lead to, okay? Let's see what it leads to. Did Paul have this problem in his day? Like I told you, just sides, go back to the side to recap some of the stuff we've already talked about. Paul, it says the latter times in 1 Timothy 4, chapter 1. Latter times, he's telling Timothy, hey, as time goes by, this stuff's going to get worse. We're seeing a little bit of it. As we're going to see here, we're going to see it big time with Gentiles. We're seeing these problems, but it's going to get worse and worse with time. Until the last days, where it's just out of control. So 1 Corinthians 5.1, is this happening in Peter's time, or Paul's time, I'm sorry, Paul's time, and Timothy's time. 1 Corinthians 5.1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. That's how bad it is. People always say, well, it's just you know, a stepmom or something. It doesn't say that you're adding to God's word. It just says to have his father's wife. We don't know how bad it is, but it's bad. Verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, for verily, for I verily, as absent in body, but present in the spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In other words, he's saying, I don't need to see it. If you say it's happening and there's enough men saying, hey, that or good report, this is happening. You even have the lost world laughing. Hey, look what's going on over here. 
I don't need to be there to see it. I can judge it without being there. Verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and my spirit. Remember I said we're all part of the body of Christ. When one person sets a bad example, the rest of us suffer. Oh, you're a Bible-believing Christian. I saw this Bible-believing Christian over here doing such and such. And then you guys sit there and explain to them that's a sin, that's wrong, and then it looks like we're going against each other. See how it makes the body of Christ look bad? That's why he says in my spirit. I might not physically be there, but we're part of the body of Christ. I'm there with you in spirit. Verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. People always say it's talking about saved, that's talking about saved. I think he's talking about a lost person. But we'll get to saved people being treated this way, I understand. But I think ultimately he's questioning the salvation of the Corinthians. If, let's see, if a man be called a brother, check whether he be in the faith. There's so many passages, even in Galatians, where he's doubting people's salvation. Okay? Deliver him to what Satan is destruction of flesh. How do you do that? You treat him as a heathen and a publican. You're lost. You're not allowed in our fellowship. Get out. You're kicking him out into the world to deliver such one as the Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul may be saved. You're not going to act right. Get out. We're going to treat you as if you're lost. Here's a salvation message to, to remind you. Get out. Don't come back until you repent and get your heart right with the Lord if you're truly saved. Verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Glorying. Remember what it says? Who God, whose God, capital G, God is their belly. And whose glory is their shame. Is in their shame. Sometimes I'm bad with the addresses. Philippians 3.19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Your glory is not good. They're glorying in their shame. So what does that mean? Their God is their belly, is their flesh. So is this talking about saved people? I don't believe so. Now, know ye not that a little leaven, lost people, leaveneth the whole lump, saved? They can come in and mess up a whole group of saved men. That's why you don't fellowship with the lost world. And when God brings to light that this person's false and fake, get out. Now, for saved, yes, little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. When you let a little sin in, it sin begets sin begets sin, and next thing you know, the whole lump is ruined. The whole piece of bread. I right. understand that, but for Kant, for what's going on here, I believe it's talking about you're letting saved people in, and they're getting you to do things you're not supposed to do. They're getting you to depart from the faith. Verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven. He's not talking about sin, he's talking about people. He said, Deliver such a one as to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He's talking about the person that's doing these sins. Purge out the old leaven that ye may be a new lump. Ye, talking about the body of Christ there, the people. Okay. And instruction righteousness, it applies to us personally. I understand that. But I'm just trying to point out, it's talking about people. There's people in sin, and he's telling you, kick those people out. Purge out that leaven, the old leaven. As ye are unleavened, so that everybody's there is unleavened. You have someone who's leavened, kick them out. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. It always brings back, I pause there for a second. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. It always comes back to this. The old man is dead and buried with Christ. Crucified with Christ. That's the whole point of communion. Making sure that old man is dead and buried with Christ and the new man is risen. That's the whole point of, of doing communion. You evaluate your life. Am I living for Jesus Christ? Do I need to get that? That needs to get out of my life. Okay, did I forget anything, Lord? Am I doing what's right? Am I being that new man, the new creature that's in Christ Jesus? Or is that old man still there? That's the whole point. And pe some people just don't get it. 
Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, the old man, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, the new man, new man, new woman. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're come out of the world because we're set apart. We're distinct. We're different from the world. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We belong to God, Jesus Christ. Okay. Turn to Matthew 18, 15. This is an example. I know it's Old Testament, but we just read there in two te the New Testament saying, Hey, deliver one as the Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You treat them as if they're lost. Get out of our fellowship. Don't come back until you repent and get your heart right with the Lord. And get that out of your life. Don't bring that filth into the body of Christ. Is basically what you're saying. What happens when you forbid marriage? It leads to fornication. Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brethren shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. I always say this and I'll say it again. The brethren have a hard time with this. I don't know why. But sometimes it's confrontation. A lot of times we don't like confrontation and we just... Uh, this just seems to be a hard thing for us to do. Brother in Christ has wronged you. You don't just disappear and take off. You don't try to sow seeds of destruction, whisperings, backbiting. Okay? Sowing division. You go to that brother one-on-one -on -one and talk with them. That brother will not hear you. It says, if he shall not hear thee. But if he repents... Was it him alone? If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If he repents, forgive him. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witness every word may be established. Every word may be established. This is what you're going to him with. Just wanted to point that out. Not the words of men, the wisdom of men, the ways of the world, being conformed to the world. No. This is the words. May every word may be established. Right. And if you neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. You're to treat him as if he's lost. That's the whole point. That's why I believe that passage when it says give him over to the, Satan to the destruction of the flesh, he's talking about lost people because that's what you treat lost people. Get out. Here's the gospel message again. Get out. Don't come back until you can show that you've repented, that you're living a life of Christ, and that you're actually saved. You could have been saved and you just need to repent and get your heart right with the Lord and get it out, or you are a false convert. But either way, we're treating you like you're lost. Get out. Don't come back until you're saved. That's what you're supposed to do. I just wanted to point that out. So fornication is serious. It's a serious sin. I mean, all sin is serious, but this is a sin that talks about how you, you sin against your own body. Not about the flesh, like telling a little lie or something like that. This is sinning against your own body. Okay. Now, Peter is an example of someone married in ministry. People say, well, he's married. Turn to Matthew 8, 14. Peter was never married. He's the first pope. Okay. You want to read about somebody who's married in the ministry? Read Acts. Read about Peter. Okay. Matthew 8, 14. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother. Laid and sick of the fever. Peter had a wife. Peter's an example of a man who's married in ministry. Okay. You can be married and be in ministry. You're going to be limited. People always say, well, today we got the internet and we got technology. But in his day, he, was stopped, he stayed in one area. He's got a wife and he might even have kids. I'm not adding to scripture, but I'm not going to subtract from scripture. Okay, it doesn't say he had kids. It says he has a wife. But you got a man who has a wife that we know of. He might have had kids, 
but he's got people he's responsible to as well as the as uh, it's the ministry. Okay, ministry came first, then his family. That's how it's supposed to be. God blessed him mm -hmm. with a wife. You can be in ministry with a wife, but his ministry was based in an area. Okay, I have this area. I'm a, to the Jewish people. I'm a, the apostle to the Jews, and he was in one area. He's married. Then you have Paul, an example of someone that is single in the ministry. Do you have more options on how to serve the Lord in ministry when you are single? Okay, 1 Corinthians 7.7. 7. Yeah, Paul was more mobile. He was going around church to church to church, traveling all the time. I hope I can come back and see you guys again. I hope I can, come back. I can write you letters and everything. They write letters. And He's very versatile. He's going all over the place. He doesn't have a wife that he has responsibilities to or children that he has a responsibility to. Right? He can cover larger ground. And he did with the Gentiles. That's why he's the apostle to the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. If I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. It's a calling to be married. Okay, It's a gift. Okay? It's not a punishment. It's a gift. Okay. The gift of God, when God gives you a, a Bible-believing, God-fearing woman as a wife, or a Bible-believing, God-fearing man as a husband, it's a gift. Verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. I only put this in there to show that he's single. Okay, he's not married. So, you can still serve the Lord being married, and you can still serve the Lord being single. You can do it either way. I do believe the Bible teaches that if you're single, you can be more effective for the Lord than being married. But I, like I said, the limitations that they had then, today we've got the internet. I do a Bible study, I put it out there, people can see it all around the world. You don't have to travel everywhere. I still miss the face-to-face, -face. don't get me wrong. I, I would love to have house churches more than internet ministries. If I had five, ten people that came over every week to do a Bible study, I probably wouldn't be on YouTube as much. I might record the Bible studies and be like audio studies like Brother Brian did when he first got started. That was great. But um, being able to teach the Word and preach the Word face to face, hold each other accountable face to face, be able to see who the person is, truly is, face to face. You really can't tell people who people are on the internet, on YouTube and Facebook and whatnot, you really can't tell the character of a person. You can when you're face to face. There's people that are face to face that can bear witness and you can trust those people absolutely, but they still need to be you know, face to face to truly see somebody. All we can do on the internet is err on the side of caution. Okay, So I just want to throw that out there. Okay, Feminists try to use the whole chapter, this chapter 7, feminists try to use the whole chapter to prove that you do not have to get married. It does not change the fact that they have to have a head covering. It's there. The Bible teaching we already talked about, I'm not going to go into it. A woman's supposed to have a head covering. It's your saved father. The saved eldest man in your family. Elders, elder men in the church. Saved men. They're willing to take on the responsibility of being a head covering for the younger women. Okay? Or, or widows. Because the, the pastor talks about how they had to set people up to take care of widows. Head coverings. Uh, the pastor can be a head covering for the younger women. And you have a husband. But a head covering is required by Scripture for a woman. There's no way to get out of that. None. But you still have people today, feminists, I don't need a, I don't need a man. No man tells me what to do. And I can go off on a whole study on that, and some people have. But I just wanted to throw that in there. You can be married. You can be single in ministry. Timothy's single. From my understanding, he's single in ministry. It doesn't mention him having a wife. Okay? And Paul was single in ministry. But you can be married in ministry. Peter was married in ministry. Okay? But when you happens when you forbid people to get married, what does it lead to? Okay? It leads to fornication.
Did I miss something? We haven't gotten to it yet. That's something else. Okay. I'm thinking the next part meets. I'm getting ahead of myself again. <laughs> I'm just excited. I love the word of the Lord. And I know you brothers and sisters of Christ out there love the word of the Lord. Okay. What else does forbidding Mary to marry lead to? Okay. We got fornication. But what does it, all, what does it lead to? Sin begets sin. Perversion always gets worse and worse and worse. Turn to Romans 1.26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use. Remember that word, natural use. Unto that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burning their lust one towards another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meat. Well, I say remember that word, brother, sister, Christ, because people always get confused or they're going to try to confuse you. Sodomy is just what the wor lost world calls homosexuality. No, sodomy is anything that goes against the natural use. Apologize, had an interruption. Turn to 2 Timothy 3.1. Remember, natural use. It's anything that goes against the natural use of... A uh, man and a woman coming together to procreate, to have children, okay? There's people in the Old Testament where the woman was barren. The husband and wife were coming together in marriage, but they were barren. But the whole point of the natural use is you have a man and a woman to have a child. That's called the natural use. So sodomy is anything that goes against the natural use. Don't let people lie to you and say, well, that doesn't fall under sodomy. Anything that goes against the natural use is sodomy. That's what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. 2 Timothy 3.1 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. This is in 2 Timothy. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Okay, the Bible talks about be not conformed to this world. Okay. All this stuff that you see in here that we're reading, Boasters, proud. Notice we saw the word proud. What did we read up there? Don't think yourselves above that you are. Keep yourself meek, lowly, humble. We see the word proud in there. Okay. So, you're going to have all this stuff around you, and the Bible says, be not conformed to this world. The world is going to try to grab you and try to pull you back, to get you to depart from the faith. Be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, not just by words, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mm -hmm. So, we see there, just throwing it in real quick, what does fornication lead to? Or what does forbidding to marry lead to? Fornication. And then over time, fornication leads to sodomy. Just keeps getting worse and worse. What does that lead to? Turn to Matthew 18.6. But who shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me it were better for him that a milestone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea? This is also mentioned in Mark 9.42. It's mentioned in Luke 17.1. Remember what we talked about, brothers and sisters Christ, when the Bible says things over and over and over, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's important. Maybe it's very important. This is three times. Three times in the uh, Gospels, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. We're going to read that sometimes God will do things three times in a row to get it to sink in. It's important. It's very important. Okay? But what does it lead to? Child molestation. Do we see that going on today, left and right? Yes. Do we see sodomy out there, left and right today? Yes. Fornication. Yes. I'm getting ahead of myself again, but I'll... Everything in this world today promotes fornication, not marriage. It's 
It's almost anti-marriage, and it promotes fornication. Yeah. What does it continue to lead to? I turn to Leviticus 20.10. We're going to wrap this whole thing up with the forbidding to marry. What does it lead to? It leads to going against the natural use. It leads to sex outside of marriage and going against the natural use of the man and the woman. That's what it does. It's all about lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. You start sinning against your own body. And it turns you away from the faith. You, just, you start departing from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits. And then they'll hold that against you, what you're doing there. How you're living. Okay, fine, I'll go with the doctrines that you, you're saying. See how it works? Blackmail, if you want to say blackmail. Okay. Leviticus 20.10 And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. Why? Because you sin against your own body. In the Old Testament, your body and soul are connected. In the New Testament, the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ, we're spiritually circumcised. Our body is no longer attached to our soul. So I understand it's the Old Testament, but bear with me. But you still sin against your own body. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Notice how it says his father's wife here. Again, it's always just referred to as his father's wife. His father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. And blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall be surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be put upon them. If any man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, and it is wickedness, they shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that they, there be no wickedness among you. In other words, they were put to death. Here's, the, here's where it can really get to really messed up. And perversion. Perverted. 15. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death. And he shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down thereto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Sexual perversion. Forbidding to marry leads to fornication and sexual perversion. And that's what Satan wants. And that's a great way to get people away from the faith. Get you to fall into sin, but this sin is wicked sin. That you're sinning against your own body. Okay? Why did I read all that? Why did we go through all that? Come on, that's disgusting. It is disgusting. But you go to Sodom and Gomorrah, what was going on there? All this stuff. So the judge of the oh, whole earth, so the judge of the whole earth do right. If there was any one that was innocent, he wouldn't have destroyed the entire city. The women were perverted. Okay? The men were perverted. The children were perverted. The animals were perverted. I just wanted to really strike this home. Sodomy is anything that goes against the natural use. All of it's sodomy. Okay? Woman with woman, sodomy. Man with man, sodomy. People with animals, sodomy. Molestation of children, sodomy. So what's going on in the world today? There's this big push to fornicate. Have a great time. You have MGTOW, men going their own way. At first it seemed good. I mean, I know some brethren didn't do a good study on it as far as what it, what it was all about. It started out with, hey, women, the feminism is getting out of control. The laws in America are getting out of control. And it's just safer to be single. But what happened? Men got in there and said, you know what? We're going to use this as an excuse to fornicate. 
Now, I'm not for uh, MGTOW men going their own way at all. We just read it's a gift. God's a calling. God can call, call a man to be single. God can call a man to be a head covering for a woman and take care of her and be a husband. Okay? God's the one who decides that. And you're not supposed to be part of some group that forces it. Forces being single. Okay? But the whole point is, is feminism got out of control and everything, and they said, well, we're going to start this group, and you have people come in, and, okay, I want to be part of this group and just fornicate. What is it leading to? Um, I mean, what's going on in the world is what we're talking about. Men going their own way. Abortions. Fornication is so out of control, people are having children they don't want, and instead of taking responsibility, we'll just do bail worship. They were fornicating left and right at the Tower of Babel. Before the Tower of Babel, when you had um, Samaramus, Nimrod, and Tamutz. I always thank the Lord when he helps my memory. Nimrod, Tamutz, and Samaramus. But you had Nimrod supposed to be worshipped as a god. She's a goddess. And then uh, Tamutz is Nimrod reborn when Nimrod died. His son, but it's really Nimrod reborn. But you had Samaramus come in, and she was promoting this fornication. Everybody fornicating left and right, and everybody's having all these children. So what do we do with these children? Well, we're going to sacrifice them to God, Baal, false god, Baal. So then they were sacrificing uh, children, babies, make them go through the fire. Today, you get abortions, and how do they take care of all the wet medical waste? It has to go through the fire. Right? Abortion is Baal worship today. Flat out. What's a, uh, what's it a part of? Fornication. Them being the whole push of marriage isn't that important. Right? You have fornication being promoted on every level. Movies, TV shows, video games, the secular, satanic, worldly music industry. Okay? Uh, commercials. Okay? Fornication is being promoted at every level. Okay, I put in feminism. Okay. The push to not get married. You can be your own man. You can have your own career. You can have your own life. You can do whatever you want. No man tells you what to do. That leads to not getting married. That leads to fornication. Well, I'm just going to fornicate. I've seen this in my life as a lost Christian, false Christian, lost, false convert, if I can say it right. And I've seen it as a saved man. Mm -hmm. Sodomy. Do we have problems with sodomy in this world today? Uh, you think? Now they're trying to make uh, marriage in a lot of states, uh, uh, sodomite marriages, legal. There's no such thing as sodomite marriage. Okay. We see this stuff going on in the world, and all this stuff is pulling people away from the faith. A lot of false people are coming out, and we're seeing them as being false. Oh, you can be a sodomite and be a Christian. You're false. Get out. You're lost. Get out of our fellowship. We're seeing this more and more. Mm -hmm. We already talked about, when I talked about Sodom, all that went on in Sodom and Gomorrah, we talked about that. All of that stuff, the wickedness that went on, sexual perversion, okay, divorces in America, but in the world. Oh, if you're unhappy, just get divorced and go get with somebody else. That's still fornication. That's adultery. But I've already done a study. It's a justification for separation or divorce. Okay? The man hasn't committed adultery and you leave him, I'm divorcing him and I'm going to get with this other guy. You're the one committing adultery. The only justification for divorce is adultery. But today, anything goes. If you're just unhappy, get a divorce. All about, you know, marriage isn't that important. It's not that sacred. It's not a big deal. And I believe in the time of Jacob's trouble, and I've already said this, everybody always says that we're always worried about people, food, you're starving, and you want food, and you want clothes in the time of Jacob's trouble. That is there. But I ultimately believe the number one thing that's going to promote people to, get, to take the mark and to worship the beast is sin for a season. They're going to appeal to the flesh. Have a good time. Fornication is going to be 
huge. Sodomy is going to be huge. Baal worship, I believe, is going to be huge in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. Woe unto you that give suck in those days. Okay. All this stuff. It's going to be huge. Why? Because sin for a season appeals to people. What gets uh, men to fall, depart from the faith, sin for this season, and cares of this world. Those two things. When you ultimately want to wrap it all up, sin for a season, and cares of this world. So that's where we're going to end it there when it comes to um, forbidding to marry. What does it lead to? Forbidding to marry leads to fornication, sinning against your own body. It gets you to go after the ways of the world and how wicked the world's getting, and it's getting worse and worse and worse in the latter days. Until we get to the end, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And we're being warned. Timothy's being warned by Paul, and Timothy's being told we're supposed to warn other people. And I'm warning you stay away from that stuff. Take marriage seriously. Okay. Now, next, we see the command to abstain from meats in verse 3 in 1 Timothy 4, 3. Um, 1 Timothy 4, 3, we'll read it all through again. Commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving, of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. You pray over your food. Now, before we really get into this, I just a little side note because some people get on, get on to me. I don't do big prayers on the camera. Why? Because prayer is between you and the Lord. That's what prayer is. I cannot pray for you. I can pray. I always say this and it confuses people until I explain it. I can pray for you, but I can't pray for you. What is that talking about? You can come to me with a prayer request and I can pray Hey, watch over this brother in this area or help this brother in this area. But you need to take it to God first. You need to take it to God directly between you and God. Okay? You can't just sit there and go, I'm never going to pray. That person's praying for me. I can't do that. You need to take it to God first. But ultimately, prayer is one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. That's why Jesus talks about when you pray, you pray in the closet. Not necessarily in a closet, but he's saying it's private. It's between you and the Lord. That's what that's all talking about. The only time I saw Jesus, and someone wants to correct me, correct me. The only time I saw, G ta saw Jesus in the Bible praying with, where other people were around is when he was breaking bread, giving God thanks for the food. Mm -hmm. Do you do that in front of other people? Absolutely. I'm just not a big proponent of putting on this big, I'll let you pray, pray, pray in front of everybody. You're supposed to do that one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. I'll pray for the food when there's brethren with me. I'll pray over the food together. Absolutely. I'll take prayer requests. I will pray for you. Please pray for me. I'm a big pusher of prayer. The Bible says pray without ceasing. I just want to put that out there again. Mm -hmm. But your prayer life is supposed to be between you and the Lord. Your personal relationship with the Lord. One-on-one. -on -one. That's what personal is. It's when it's one on one. Okay. So abstaining from meats. What is this talking about? How is this supposed to be getting people to depart from the faith and giving heed to seducing spirits? How does it get people to turn from the true doctrines to doctrines of devils? Okay. Um, we're going to read Leviticus 11.1 1, and we're going to read until we get the point across because it goes on a ways. Um, Leviticus 11.1 1. Leviticus 11, chapter 11, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whoso shall part, parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof. 
as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. We'll keep going for a little bit. Or the flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch. You don't even touch the carcass. They are unclean to you. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales as the waters in the sea and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. To mute it. Sorry, brothers and sisters. Them shall ye eat. Verse 10. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, and of them living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. They shall be even an abomination unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses an abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. I'll go ahead and stop there, but we can keep going. There's meats for the Jewish people. There's meats that's clean, and there's meats that's unclean. Things they can eat in the ocean have scales and fins. Things they're not supposed to eat in the ocean. Things that are in the air that they, they can't eat. Uh, things on the ground that they can and can't eat. Okay, we see that. But this abstaining from meats, what does it truly symbolize? People always keep coming back to, um, you know, people who tell you you need to be abstained from all meats because you need to be a um, vegetarian or a vegan, okay? Is that what's really going on here? God kind of helped me open my eyes to what's really going on here. Turn to Acts 10. We're going to read 9 through 22. Acts 10. a lot in this one. My large print book. 10, we're going to start in verse 9. Okay, this is Peter. He's going out and he's preaching the plan of salvation to the Jewish people and only the Jewish people. Look at verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. When were all matters of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have not eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice, spake, and the voice spake unto him again the second time. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. That's why we pray over our foods. God clean this, make this food clean. This was done thrice. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. There we see the number three again. Remember, heaven and earth shall pass away three times in the gospel. We read how it mentioned three times to not to offend these little ones in the three gospels. There's things that God will repeat several times to make a point that it's important. This is very important. Is it trying to say that it's important that we eat any meat? We'll see the importance. Verse 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision would, which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon which was surnamed Peter was lodged there while Peter thought on the vision the spirit said unto him behold three men seek thee these are Gentiles arise therefore and get thee down and go with them doubting nothing for I have sent them then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said behold I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And you keep reading the story there. He witnesses and tells him about Jesus Christ. Okay. That's the whole point. 
when someone's, we're going to get through this some more, but when someone's forbidden to eat meat, it's symbolizing that they're forbidding people to get saved. Okay? Forbidding people to eat meat today is like forbidding people to get saved. That's the whole point when we read that. Uh, Calvinists, we have cult groups. You've got to be part of our group or you're not saved. Okay? We talked about the Eugenics Society of America back there when it's talking about forbidding to, to marry certain people. You had to marry within our group. You've got to be part of our group. And you've got people that say in order to be part of us, you have to abstain from certain meats. I think the Mormons do it. You have to abstain from certain meats or you're not saved. What's this all about? It's about salvation. When people are forbidden, it's not about, hey, I want to be a vegetarian, that's fine. It's not good for you, but if you want to be, it's fine. I'm going to be a vegan, it's not good for you fully, but if you want to, fine. The whole point behind what we're reading here in 1 Timothy 4, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, it's all about pushing people away from Jesus Christ and getting them to go after the world. No. Victoria's hearing some noises. Okay, Acts eleven eighteen. Okay, this is after he's had the vision that we just read there. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, "Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life." There's that pesty word, repentance. That most of the professing Christian world they hate that word. They hate it so much they'll change the definition or change the word completely or just make it like it doesn't exist. Remember, they change the words, they change the definitions, or they'll drop it completely. But you see there, that was the whole point. Now you can eat anything. God has made it clean. God has made me clean when he saved me. He's made you clean if you're born again and saved. He saved you. That's the whole point. But also works can be, like I said, we'll talk about the work side real quick because I really want to get into this. There is work side where people say, we're forbidding you to eat certain meats, but what they're really saying is, is you can't get saved if you eat any meat. That's what they're saying. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10.25, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 10.25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat asking no question for conscience sake. You're allowed to eat with the lost world. But if any man say unto you, This is offered and sacrificed unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Is there food we're not supposed to eat? Yes. The only food we're commanded not to eat is food offered unto idols. You go to a lot of restaurants, Chinese is a big one, uh, Japanese, you'll see false gods everywhere. There's the Buddha and everything, they have all these false gods. Mexican restaurants, oftentimes you go into the Mexican restaurant and you'll see the sun god and Aztec, they have this big Aztec theme and the sun god. What is that? You're eating food offered unto idols. Okay. Be very careful. 29. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? What's going on here when it says my liberty is being judged? True liberty for a New Testament Christian is you're being freed from the law of sin and death. God saved you. You can fail him. You can fall on your face. It's not justified, but you can fall on your face and sin against God and fail him, and you won't lose your salvation. You need to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and get back to following Jesus Christ. Absolutely. But you won't lose your salvation. But what this is saying here is you've got people saying, hey, you're eating certain meats that you're not supposed to. You're lost. You're not saved. And if you were saved, you lost your salvation. That's what's going on here. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? You're giving God thanks. He's cleaning the food. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, not just eat and drink, but whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. If what you're doing you can't give God glory in, you shouldn't be doing it. It's that simple. Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Three separate people there. Lost Jews, lost Gentiles, or saved sinners. The church of God. If I have Jews over, I'm not going to put pork out in front of them. It says right here, give none offense. 
I'm not going to try to purposely offend them. There's Gentiles that don't eat certain food. You have a Gentile that comes over that's a, a vegetarian or a vegan. I'll make a salad for him. I'm not going to just throw meat in front of him and say, that's all I got. Sorry, tough. That's offensive. Okay. 33. Even as I please all men and all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. That's the focus. That's why you don't offend them. You don't offend them because we all have to get along. I think you don't offend them because you want to be able to preach the gospel to them. You want that door to be open. That's why. Okay. But we see there, going back to it, ultimately forbidding a marriage. Permitting to marry and commanding to abstain from meats gets people to go after the world and not after Christ. That's the whole point, brothers and sisters of Christ. That's why this is a warning to Timothy. People being forbidden to marry, you're going to start falling into all kinds of sin, fornication, and it's going to pull you away from the Lord. It's going to get you to depart from the faith. You're going to start listening to the flesh and seducing spirits. You're going to start turning your back on the main, all the doctrines that God has that point you to Jesus Christ. It's going to point you to the world, to the flesh, to Satan, the lowercase g God of this world. Okay? Now, I want to end this 1 Timothy 4.6. Okay? Don't fall into a group that forbids to be married. Okay? Don't fall into a group that's forbidden to, eat, to abstain from meats. Why? Because both of those, when you look into it, it's all about salvation. It's all about living for Jesus Christ and going after Jesus Christ. I always point after, that's the world. After Jesus Christ and not after the world. Not after this flesh, but after Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 4.6, the last, chapter, uh, last verse in our section of expository study that brings it all together. If you leave out 6, there's no point in reading 1 through 5. Verse 6, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. The words of faith and good doctrine. One to thou hast attained. This is the first letter that Paul wrote P uh, Timothy. What about the second letter Paul wrote Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Everybody gets judged, saved and lost. I'm sorry to these faith alone people. Oh, I, don't, I can do whatever I want. I'm not going to be judged. I'm free. No, you're not. Everybody gets judged, saved and lost. At his appearing, catching up in the body of Christ, then we have the judgment seat of Christ. And his kingdom, he's going to be judging all throughout the kingdom, I understand that, but at the end of the thousand year reign, the great white throne judgment happens. Lost people. So you have saved and lost. Two, we're to preach the word. I'm sorry, i got to, I got to correct a lot of the brethren out there. Men in ministry and people making comments. I see a lot of men's words, not God's words. There's a lot of times that I think we're getting lazy. Oh, we'll just say the Bible says such and such, and we're not going to take time to look it up. You don't have to, I always like to copy and paste the entire verses when I'm putting them on there. But you don't have to put the verse on it. You can just say 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 6 says such and such. And make the person look it up themselves, as far as actually opening it up and read what it says. But we're getting away from actually preaching the Word. We're getting a lot to where we're talking more about our own words feelings and opinions. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with someone giving a testimony saying this is what happened to me, but make sure you're always applying it to Scripture. When you're pointing out what's going on in the world, make sure you're applying it to Scripture, saying the Scripture said this is going to happen, and what's going on is wrong. Why? Because the Bible says this is how we're supposed to be, brothers and sisters in Christ. You always apply it to the Word of God, and we're starting to drift away from that. It's thus saith man, I said it's in the Bible, therefore it's in the Bible. And you could be right. I want to throw that out there. You could say this is in the Bible and you can be 100% right, but where's the foundation? This is the foundation. You need to be quoting it. Okay. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, 
rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We do it with long suffering and with doctrine. We reprove, we rebuke, and we exhort. These old phones don't know how to mute. <laughs> Long-suffering doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, sin for a season, gets you to take your eyes off Jesus Christ. So they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou now, watch thou in all things endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Full proof. Prove your own selves. My min it's, the ministry, it's, even if it says it's my ministry, it's God's ministry, I'm just doing what He tells me to. But it needs to have a foundation, and when I need to prove it. That's why I tell you, get your King James Bibles out and open up and follow along. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. And it's not just in words. The life I live is how you also prove your ministry. How do we know this? For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. He's saying the life I've lived. I live for Jesus Christ, not just in words, but in deed. My actions, the works I've done for the ministry, how I live my life, I set the example. Okay. And my encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, preaching the word, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 3.8 says, Now as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They're fake. They're frauds. But they shall proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Notice he says manner of life. How I live my life. You know, I'm not a reprobate. I'm not fake. It's not do as I say, not as I do. It's I live by example. Then, persecutions, afflictions, which came up unto me at... Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but all of them, all the Lord, all the Lord delivered me. The Lord will deliver us, whether it's taking us home <laughs> or actually getting us out of that physical trouble. The Lord will deliver us. Mm -hmm. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall shuffle, suffer persecution. It's not this nitpicking that's going on on YouTube. Oh, I'm suffering persecution because people are saying bad things about me, nitpicking back. Right. That's like children you see on YouTube. True persecution, you're going to lose family. Friends aren't going to want to be with you or be around you. Family's not going to be around you. You can lose wives. You can lose children that will turn against you. You have people just turn against you. Okay? True persecution. Then you got people that will get on and just promote lies and hypocrisy. They'll lie about you. And they'll show themselves to be hypocrites when they're trying to show you to be a hypocrite. There's persecutions. People were writing letters in Paul's name. Okay? People were coming in and messing up all the work that Paul had done. Pointing people after Jesus Christ. 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They keep deceiving people, and after a while, they start believing their own deceptions. They start out with, oh, it's a lie, and I know I'm lying to people, but I love deceiving people because I want the praise of men. We've done studies on that. But after a while, they start falling into the trap that they start believing their own deception. They start getting proud, thinking high of themselves. 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Not just that I learn from the Bible. The Bible reflects my life. And God has shown me so much in my life. And I've been assured that this is God's perfect written word. Assured that I'm living right because I have God's perfect written word. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Remember the good men that have, uh, the good men who have answered the call and come into ministry. Okay? If they're wrong on something, use the scripture to correct them. But remember... 
It says there, Thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Paul's like, I'm not a reprobate. You learned it from me. And it's truth. And you've been assured of it by my life that I live and the life that you live. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto, unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved. And all scriptures given by inspiration is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You know how you stay, keep from departing from the faith? You stay in the book. And you keep living your life going after Jesus Christ according to the book. It's not in here. You need to correct your life. Change your life so it lines up with the book. Okay? Thank you for watching this study and, and carrying on. And I hope this has encouraged the brethren to not fall away from the faith. To not give a heed to seducing spirits. Not turning from the doctrines of the Bible. Okay. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.